has so been stop watching Fox or CNN or whatever you watch with the fake news. Great people. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of TRD Talks Live. I'm Eric Enquist, Senior Managing Editor at The Real Deal. I'm happy to be joined today by City Councilman Keith Powers. We may be joined very soon by another City Councilman, Eric Ulrich from Queens. But if not, it'll just be me and Keith Powers for the next half hour or so. And we're going to be talking politics and real estate. But before we begin, just a reminder to please go to therealdeal.com. Look for that little red button that says subscribe and click on that, subscribe to our content and help us continue these twice a week or three times a week, TRD Talks Live, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at five o'clock. So Councilman, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the invitation. So this has been an interesting uh, time in the city council. Most city council votes are 45 to six of that nature. Suddenly you had a budget where 17 no votes came in. And this was probably the closest vote, vote you've been involved with, I'm guessing, uh, in the city council? I think so. I think so. Um, and we had, you know, we had it kind of split down the middle on the no votes between those who wanted to do uh, uh, less and was those who wanted to do more when it comes to the budget this year. Um, but it was, I think, probably amongst one of the closest votes we'll have, probably have had, there's Eric, uh, so far in the council. So it was 30 to 17, and those 17 as you noted, were split between people who thought there was not enough uh, of a cut to the police department, and then others who thought there was too much of a cut to the police department. Tell the viewers uh, where you f fell on that, on that debate. I ultimately, I mean, like, I look, like many of us, I struggled with the entire the entirety of the budget. And I think that every budget we have moving forward in the next few years is going to be filled with hard to fill revenue gaps. It's going to be followed with big decisions. And in this particular moment, responding to both COVID and a call for special action, we had three weeks remaining in the, uh, in the budget process as this was unfolding. We took a vote at the, I think the mid, you know, midnight of the last remaining day before we hand our budget over to the state in some fashion, or we risk going and letting the mayor take full control over the budget. Um, and I think actually probably both Eric and I agree that we wanted to, the council to be in, in, in control of the budget, not, not the mayor. So it was went to the very last second to try to get everything we can on a number of items. We saved a number of the items that were on the on the chopping block this year, it's good. But next year is going to so I mean obviously next year is going to be more painful as we have to make deeper cuts. I wish we were able to do more this year, but as you look at uh, a vote at the very end of June, uh, essentially midnight, it was to me the you know take what is progress here and, and continue this conversation moving forward. Right. So so whenever I see a city council vote scheduled for six o'clock and then move to eight o'clock and then move to ten o'clock. That tells me that the speaker is trying to round up enough votes for a measure to pass. Is that in fact what was happening? I, you know, it's, it's you know, I don't want to call anybody out by name, but I think that, you know, there are people who need to get their pay. I mean, there is actually a bunch of paperwork that we have to do before we go in to do financial disclosures. I know they're rounding people up for that. There were these last minute decisions to make sure we had details uh, put together. And I think, you know, making sure that the budget we voted on was all the loose ends were tied into that. But certainly I think there are lots of people who are struggling with it uh, in terms of where we landed on some big questions. We didn't, have much, we didn't have any time left, but I think for those who want to see this conversation evolve, uh, there's a lots of opportunity here to do that. And also we have to get very serious very quickly about a deep financial hole that we're in in the city. So one of the things that's interesting about city council, like you might ask, why would a real estate audience care about this? But in fact, most of the people that I've known in real estate, and I've been covering this for, for a couple of decades, is that as politics go, so goes real estate in this town. And I wonder if you could share your perspective on that. You, re you represent Midtown, which is some of the most expensive real estate uh, on the planet. And can you like draw that link for our viewers? Uh, yeah, sure. in terms of, go ahead. I think there's two parts to that. I mean, there's three parts to it. One is um, a very basic one. And when it comes to the budget time, which is our revenue is so driven by property taxes in the city. So many of the decisions that we make are really uh, are in, this, in, this, in this budget in the city are based on what our tax revenues are predominantly driven by property tax. Number two is we are a central actor in this process in many occasions where we talk about big rezonings in the city or even some small neighborhood stuff with ULERPs, special permits, a lot of terminology people are probably familiar 
and all that. We are a decisive vote in that. We have a lot of, and we have a lot of influence over the process throughout it because of that. And third is we are in a, we are in a financial crunch. We are in a city that desperately needs more housing, more affordable housing. Many of the policy goals that we have in the city, I know at least I have, are, are connected to real estate, land use, zoning, development, in terms of achieving those. So um, it, it is a very big part of the conversation. We at the council have a big role in it. And our role here in zoning is, is one of maybe the five or four biggest things we do in this city. It's about zoning, it's about shaping the city and shaping the future of the city. So what, what are some of those priorities that you mentioned in terms of land use? City councils had land use power basically since the Board of Est Estimate was dismantled all those years ago when it was right. found so what are your what are your um, your land use goals? Yeah, a couple things. One is I want to make sure that we have a city that's accurately adequately prepared for the future. That means growth. That means building enough housing for people who aspire to live here, people who want to either who are born and raised here like me, or people who want to and make and keep this their home, or people who want to come here and make it their own. We just don't have frankly enough of it. I think we are endlessly debating the regulatory schemes. I am a very strong and vocal supporter of things like rent regulation. And I think we um, have to protect that as a way to help protect uh, 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 tenants here in the city and residents. But also it's a way to achieve more open space. It's a way to look at the connectivity between where people live, where they work, where, they, uh, where their public transportation lies, particularly in Midtown. I know we'll talk about these Midtown rezoning, but we try to connect some of those goals in a more tangible way by putting more transportation infrastructure in place as we build more office buildings. So it's, it's how we shape the city, but my policy goal is to make sure that people have a, a short commute that's easy to get to so they can live near where they work to build more housing and to build more housing that's affordable for people. Now, I happen to agree with you completely that the, the, the reason housing is expensive in the city, number one, is that there isn't enough of it given the demand that's present. And you can look at the numbers, you know, from now until the cows come home. The fact is, we've created a huge number of jobs and not very much housing compared to the number of jobs. So every time you create a job, that's another household, pretty much. Right. Right. Um, so, and, and you've seen it. But I think you would agree that it is very difficult politically to sell New Yorkers and New York politicians on housing. And someone who's on the inside, I wondered, you know, if you could, do you have these kinds of conversations with your colleagues? You know, because they all say they're for housing, but when push comes to shove, they're always trying to reduce, reduce, reduce the size of projects, the number of units. Yeah, like that. yeah I think that sometimes we, they are competing and sometimes we view them as competing to have more housing and to have more affordable housing. And I think particularly as projects come to the city council, we're always, I know myself, are driving to get more affordability in these projects because ultimately that's always a question who can afford the places. I mean, we know there's a supply issue, but we also, as we have these instances here where we're doing projects in our district, we're also driving to get more affordability. And the economics of these deals are extremely complicated. And I think many of us not having worked in this field of affordable housing finance or anything like that do sometimes have to like sort of untangle these complicated questions. Um, we, we talk about it all the time. I mean, these big, especially these really big projects that come through the council, whether it's like big rezonings in neighborhoods or it's projects that are getting a lot of attention. We talk and debate about the amount of subsidies that go into it. We talk about uh, how much affordability, what are the rate, what are the things. And I, I think it's an imperfect system uh, in the city. Everybody has something they uh, can pick on. So we're always trying to make it evolve. But yeah, we have these conversations all the time and, um, and trying to tailor our our function of the council to help meet those demands. The, the tricky thing is that, you know, you might study, try to study the economics of these projects and you could try to squeeze as much information out of developers as you can to figure out what's viable, what's buildable, you know, how much affordability can they build into a project. But I'm sure you have a very hard time, as do with the other 50 members of the council, explaining to constituents who are rallying outside your office with pitchforks saying, don't build this tower on my block, you know, on the next block. Like they don't want to hear that um, a project is 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 not viable if it's got you know fifty or one hundred percent affordable housing. So how do you have those conversations? I mean, most politicians are thinking about you know the next election and you know the trouble that they're going to get into with with constituents if yeah. they take a, a position. Like how do you navigate that? 
Difficultly. Uh, I mean, I think we're all have to do our best to be representatives of our districts and also to look at the big future here for the city and try to find those places where those things work together and sometimes understand what they don't. I also think, I mean, I'll talk about this in detail later, but I think that this process is just so set up to be turbocharged from the beginning where you have, you have no, nothing to measure against. We don't have anything in the city in my eyes, except for our own, our own experiences, our anecdotal experiences to measure against. I and many colleagues have called for a process in the city where we can do some better citywide and comprehensive planning around housing and development. So like when my district and other districts are looking at the needs of their, uh, of the city and also those areas, we can have something to measure against. Otherwise it becomes these debates where we sit in the bid between those who aspire to do X and those who want Y and we have to try to be a good Thing. But I think, I think that the problem is that that process sometimes is just stinks from the beginning of it. I, and I hate to put it that way, but we don't have anything by which we can say, here's what the real needs are at this moment for the neighborhood, for the city, for the community. And how does this measure up against that? And how do we make that? That would give somebody who wants to do a project something to start with to say, here's kind of the measurements I can you know, look at in this project. And that also gives us the ability to say, Here's what I think the real needs are in terms of housing, affordability, transit, things like that. So yeah. that's what I'd like to see the council move forward to get us into a better long-term plan. It's interesting, you know, in that most of the most of the projects you have the council member pushing for more and more affordability. You know, it used to be 20% uh, affordability was acceptable, and you know now that's unacceptable. Then 25% became a nice goal. Now that's seen as this insufficient. You know, 30%, maybe you can get away with it. You know, right. but really 50% is what people want now. Uh, realistically, you can't do that without heavy subsidies. So, you know, do you, have you ever been able to persuade a single constituent, you know, that their impression of some project or the economics of housing is maybe different from what they've come to believe? Well, look, I should start. I want 100% house. I want 100% affordable housing for its worth. It just, uh, this becomes extremely difficult at, at times. Um, and we, uh, yeah, look, I think that um, there have been, I've been some very good, like, ULERPs in my district that have included very meaningful and good affordable housing. Like, we did this one, it was a little bit, it was a really preservation deal, but it was in Waterside Plaza where we did very historic amounts of affordable housing for people who really was the was really the housing was really becoming unaffordable from a former Mitchell Lama program, and it's when we had to figure the entry points into it, and we had to make some decisions around that, which was based on the cost and how much you know how much the, the owner could put in, and how much the city could put in, and we had to talk through why we could do certain things and we couldn't do certain things. Mm -hmm. uh, luckily, we have not gotten into one of those uh, uh, ULERPs yet where it's. Um, uh, you know, really dig, dug, you know, dug in on a sort of number, but they, they'll, it will come and it will happen. Um, yeah, you just have to, I think you have to know what your goal is from the beginning and then sort of aim to get a project that meets it versus be continuously looking for new signals throughout the process. You kind of have to set out, lay out your goals there, tell that to your constituents, and then I think work from there. And at least you're measuring that, your, you know, that reality up to, the expectations you set forth. You know, one thing I'll give New York City credit for is that, as I noted, there's always a push for more affordability, whereas the rest of the country, they're usually pushing, locals are pushing against affordability because they view affordable housing as um, sort of a way to bring in an element that they don't want. You know, it's very borderline racist. Yeah. In cases. Um, so New York City does, you know, have at least pushing for affordability. But at the, at the same time, that has a way of reducing the total supply of housing because, of course, if you want a lot of affordability in a, in a project, you also have, a lot of, have to have a lot of market rate units to subsidize those affordable units. And then you get the folks who come in and say, I'm all for affordability, but I don't want towers. I don't want towers in my district. Um, yeah. Even in, I'm sure even in your district in Midtown, which is probably the tallest, densest district, you know, in the world, perhaps. Yeah. I'm sure yeah. you have constituents who oppose towers. Is that true? Everybody's everybody in New York City, I think, uh, uh, you know, loves and lives in their neighborhood and aspires to sort of preserve the best parts of it. And sometimes that means fighting against density. I think often it means fighting against you know new density. I look. I found a lot. I have a lot of constituents who are like who are smart and thoughtful about this. But sometimes we will disagree on 
where the final outcome of this is. I have lots of tall buildings by having Midtown, lots of tall commercial buildings, particularly by having Midtown. And I don't begrudge anybody for, um, you know, uh, trying to have the conversation about what, what the needs are of the city. But sometimes we, I see, I just, you know, we all see things just quite a little bit differently in terms of how to make our office stock be equipped for the future, how to make a housing stock there. I think you really have to be able to, you know, talk, be thoughtful and talk through those issues with people to help them make them understand and if and be respectful when you disagree. But yeah, everybody hates, I mean, look, my, I have the tallest, I have some of the tallest buildings in New York City, but even my smallest buildings would be large in some other neighborhoods in New York City. So it's, it's all very quite relative, but, um, but I just think that we should all agree that we're going to have a lot more folks wanting to move to New York City in the future. We have to aspire to build housing with every, in every single community that um, is close to transit, is, has a good school, and is affordable. And, and You're a third generation Stytown, Peter Cooper Village resident. You know, that's known as middle class housing, mm -hmm. right? So um, a lot of the uh, housing in the mayor's housing plan is middle class housing, at least on paper. You know, it's people earning, the affordable units can be people earning up to 130% of the area median income. So you're talking households with six figure incomes. So my, and, but this has run into a lot of opposition from advocates who say, you know, we, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be building affordable housing for people who are making six figures. We should be only, fo you know, focusing on that 60% of AMI. So people, you know, family of three making 40 to $50,000, you know, two minimum wage orders, you know, I have a kid living, you know, how to make housing affordable for them so they're not paying more than 30% of their income in rent. Now, I assume from, as a Stytown person, you have a different view on this. And I just wondered how those conversations go, you know, when you have them with your other colleagues and people in your district. I think it's different. I mean, I, you know, every family, I mean, if you look, talk to many of the new families who have moved in Stives in town who are putting their kids into a local school, they want predictability in rent, I think is one of the biggest things, even if they can't afford it. I mean, if they want it to be a little bit less, they also want predictability to know what their next rent's going to look like so they can do some actual planning here. Of course, they also want to have an apartment that's sort of right size for their family and that becomes incredibly tougher as you start, you know, expanding. I think the space is the biggest one. I think you know, it, it just gets harder. I think it's for everybody. I think we should actually start, we, we should be doing more and we should, our starting point should be people who are at the lowest and the hardest, um, at, at, who are the, at the, who need the most help in the city right now. That should be our starting point in terms of housing. And that includes zoning, that includes subsidy, that includes our uh, ensuring that people based on source of income or other things have access to apartments and you know, clear and regulatory hurdles, helping with rent. I think that just is our, frankly, our number one goal here in the city, but that does not, that does not, you know, exclude other people that I think desperately want to be New Yorkers, New York, Manhattanites, or Brooklynites, wherever they want to live, and also to be contributing to good paying jobs here, raise their family here, put their kids in the good schools here, and be part of it. I, but I think our starting point really always has to be trying to help those the most in need, because the rest of us have, you know, have, do have flexibility in terms of where we live for those who don't. It's just paramount to the city that we help them out. Right. No, but you sense that that's going to be a lot harder in the next couple of years because it takes a lot of subsidy to do those 30%, 40% AMI, 60% AMI units. And a $9 billion in tax revenue over two fiscal years just disappeared because of this pandemic. So, I mean, the mayor, you know, canceled capital uh, funding for, for housing preservation and development for last fiscal year and this fiscal year. So do you think, I mean, Gail Brewer suggested we should go back to the drawing board on the mayor's housing plan and come up with a new uh, way of doing it since we lost that subsidy money. But my question for you is, is that even realistic? Because it would require to do more affordability, more subsidies that we don't have. I, it was for sure that the city is getting subsidies and capital from the city in the next couple of years, absent a stimulus or something else that helps in that front. I think the money will probably like most likely flow to the most that the, the heaviest need the heaviest needs versus some more of these preservation middle class deals. I assume. Um, I, yeah, I would have to use every tool at our disposal to help keep people out of like losing their home. Like housing security is an, a tremendous part of this, and keeping people, uh, frankly, where they are. That's a cheap. That can be a cheaper proposition than some of the other uh, parts of it. Just keeping, keep frankly, where they're where their house here today, um, it's going to be requires to be a lot more creative. I, I, I don't, I haven't, I haven't looked at Gail's comments uh, to, to say absolutely yes, absolutely no, but they sound 
does sound like we're going to need to do more. And zoning is going to be part of it, I think, as well, looking at more flexibility in, in zoning. But for sure, we're going to have to do something here. But I think a cheaper proposition is the minimum is keeping people housed where they are and, and, and you know, maintaining housing security. You know, believe it or not, we should do a whole separate show on just evictions because you know, I recently looked at some eviction data and the eviction rate in New York City is, is among the lowest in the country out of all major cities. And, you know, there are a bunch of reasons for that. You know, yeah. one, just off the top of my head, if you're living in a rent stabilized apartment and you're paying less than market rate, the last thing you want is to be evicted from your apartment because you may never get a sweeter deal than that. So you're going to do anything you can to stay in that apartment. Um, you know, but there, there are other things we, you know, uh, tenants now have access to free legal services, so they're less likely to be evicted for the wrong reasons. Um, it's also hard to evict people. It can take a year to, to get someone out of an apartment. So for all of these, we put them all together. We, we don't really have an eviction problem compared to other cities. I mean, do you, do you even think that people are aware of that or do you disagree? I think, you know, I think people are aware of it. And I, you know, for me, that's a, that is a net, that's a very good positive of stuff that we have done is to keep people secure in the housing. I know that there's a, a different side, a different people have opposing views with that, but I think that to me is a, a goal here is to, you know, keep people secure and then find ways to help them through that. Um, yeah, look, I think there's gonna be lots, there is, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about the evictions post, um, post COVID when happening you know, as, as housing for is reopening. I'm concerned about just the financial stability and security, especially as the federal stimulus will start and unemployment assistance will start to run out um, and absent another stimulus. I think finan you know, 600,000 or so, I think New Yorkers are without a job right now. I mean, it's, the numbers are staggering. So there's lots of financial insecurity out there and I'm concerned about lots of it, but um, so we have to, but we have to be persistent on it. I do, I still do think it's a cheaper proposition. And, um, uh, in, in some regards. I'd like to welcome Councilman Eric Ulrich. Thank hey, you. Very much. It's great to be with you guys. So you missed our you missed our discussion on the budget vote, but I just want to go back to it briefly because you were on the other side of that, right? You were one of the 17 dissenters. And uh, thankfully you didn't bestow upon us, for those of us who actually watched that whole episode, you know, late into the night, you didn't bestow upon us a long speech about the budget budget, but I wonder if you could take, you know, 20, 30 seconds now to tell us why you voted no. Well, look, I have tremendous respect for my colleagues, especially uh, Keith Powers. He, he sits in Republican row. I know he doesn't want to admit that, but he's in the row with the other Republicans on the council, all three of us. I guess uh, they're running out of seats and uh, there aren't enough of uh, Republicans to fill up the row anymore. But uh, he's a great public servant, and uh, we agree on a lot, but there are times when we disagree, and the budget is an, is an area where uh, we came to different conclusions. I think the budget uh, was a failure for the city. I think that we failed uh, to prioritize public safety in the budget. I think that the fact that the mayor and the, uh, some of my colleagues uh, who voted against the budget, the same as I did, vote against it because I didn't think there were enough cuts to the police department. So it's kind of interesting that you had these two extremities uh, voting the same way. Uh, I voted against the budget because I thought that it would set a terrible precedent. I think without public safety, if we don't have safety in the city and we don't value and appreciate the great work that the NYPD does in trying to keep the city safe, keep New York the safest si big city in America, uh, that we're not gonna have these conversations about ha housing and economic development and, and providing services for people uh, who are uh, disadvantaged or coming from a, a community uh, uh, that has uh, seen better times. Uh, my point is that public safety has to be the most important priority for us. I don't think that was reflected in the budget. For that reason, I voted no. Mm -hmm. All right. I think you're one of those who draws a connection between you know, the safety of your community and um, and, the, and the property values. I mean, realistically, Absolutely. You know, one, one short way to make rent cheaper is to chase people out of town, uh, which we, we, we did see that back in the 70s and 80s when people left. And then when they started to come back, as it got safer, rents, rents went up. So, you know, it's sort of like, there must be a better way, isn't there, uh, Councilman, than, than, than making the quality of life less. Now, we can disagree about whether or not, you know, 1,300 cops is going to make a huge difference in safety. But let me, let me ask you both about- Can I just offer one, can I just add on to that, though? I do think it's important in the big cities that we have conversations about both the, the right side, what the right size of a police department is, how to appropriately 
um, to address public safety and have cr stronger on a data about correlation between crime and officers. I think so. I just, I, I, I under, safety is so paramount to having a good city and making people feel safe, but also uh, re that, that bearing out in reality. But I do, I do want to say, I think we have very little information at times about some of the assumptions we make around the, the, the relationship between the two things. And I think right sizing is always a conversation we have, particularly in our fiscal crisis. And I tried to say that in my two minutes as part of the speech I didn't, you know, I couldn't get to in that, but I, 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 and I tweeted it is like, that's still a conversation we should have no matter where you sit on the aisle is what is the role and what is the size. When you're talking about sizing, basically what you're saying is compared to almost every other city, maybe every other city, we have more cops. We have more cops per person. We have more cops per crime committed. We have a lot of cops. And, you know, this council actually added cops, you know, five years ago when crime was going down. Um, and now you know, the politics have shifted. Now, Councilman Ulrich, you know, you, you've been around a while. Um, does it bother you the way the, the council sort of shifted, with, you know, some blame mob rule for that? Yeah, I think that, look, as you suggested, the politics have shifted dramatically. Uh, you know, look, at AOC's election in Queens, for instance, in the Bronx, when she defeated Joe Crowley, I think people at the time thought that that was an isolated incident. I don't think it's an isolated incident. I think it's definitely an indication of a leftward drift, at least in the uh, Democratic uh, primary electorate. And we've seen that uh, manifest itself in several other local elections where longtime incumbents, people who have been really hallmarks of public service in their community have been defeated by younger, uh, more uh, progressive candidates, if you will. Uh, I think that the politics in the city is definitely shifting left. And politics, they always say, is a pendulum that goes in one direction, it comes back. You could argue that in the 90s, that the, with the election of Rudy Giuliani, that the pendulum was shifting more towards center right, you know, much more pro-business, pro-law enforcement, uh, privatization, et cetera, et cetera. Those were the priorities of the uh, welfare reform and job creation of the hallmarks of the Giuliani administration. Then it sort of continued under the Bloomberg administration. And then when Mayor de Blasio was elected, of course, he talked a lot, a great deal about the tale of two cities. And, and he tried to move that conversation to the left. And then you really, the wake up call, I think, was AOC's election. And, and that was the catalyst for some of these other uh, seats to flip. And I think that a lot of politicians in New York City, especially the ones who have been around a long time, are quite concerned about their futures, about their districts, about what their communities will look like. And you're seeing that play itself out in these elections. It's kind of interesting to watch. Well, you know, by the way, it wasn't just AOC, you know, the other threshold event was Amazon being chased out of town, which something That's true. never would have happened years ago. Absolutely That's never right. would have happened. People were like, we, yeah, we, now it's like, you, Cops. you know, that's bad. Yeah. New York is the only city, any other city would have rolled out the red carpet. New York is the only city where we allowed a small minority of, uh, or a handful of individuals who are unhappy that they, they basically didn't have a seat at the table, which is why they were upset. Uh, um, and, and they decided to chase Amazon out of town. I think that was a big mistake. We could have had 25,000 good paying jobs. It would have been game changer, not only for the borough of Queens, but for the entire city. It would have set a, a, a very important tone for other companies to come here and invest in our communities, create jobs, and help us revitalize the local economy. When we're short $9 billion in the budget and we're scraping and scrounging for funds to pay for services for poor people and the things that we all wanna see, uh, I think it's safe to say that, uh, you know, we need the cooperation and support of the private sector. The government can't do it alone. Now, do you have conversations, do both of you have conversations with the real estate community about politics in this town? Because, I mean, I do, and to a person, they are pretty scared actually about Democratic Socialists of America and the AOC thing and the whole movement to decommodify housing, take the profit out of, of real estate. Um, and they are worried about this leftward drift and the return of the bad old days. I mean, are you getting that vibe? I'll let Eric catch it. I mean, uh, okay, uh, yeah, go ahead. No, no, let, me, let, me, let me say it this way. Like, I, I think we well, I will disagree with some folks on here. I, I grew up in a rent regulated apartment, rent stabilized apartment, and I believed. And I still believe very firmly in a lot of the changes that were made last year in Albany, which are attributed to a left word drip, but I also think was a reckoning whose day was gonna come at some point when you talk about things like vacancy decontrol and, um, and housing. And I, I know, uh, you know there's uh, uh, lots of conversation we had on all those reforms, but I think there were some things that were just so obvious to me that um, were, were due their time because of, um, of changes from laws from you know 20 years ago that were likely that communities like mine like in Stuyvesant Town where people had 
really sort of been, uh, have really lost our housing under the, under the pressure of those laws and lost our community in some ways. So, I, you know, there, there, some of this stuff to me, I don't, I don't mean to say this in a, uh, in, a, uh, in a disrespectful way, but it just seemed to me some stuff that was, this was a reaction to some, I think, things as well. And, it, you know, and, and, and it was some stuff that was going to be overdue at any point in time when the Democrats took over the state Senate. I guess the question is, where, you know, how far and, you know, where were the landing spot on some of those issues? But I, I do think this was a moment that had lots of uh, energy built around it for, for quite a time. What do you make of the trend among politicians not to accept donations from the real estate industry? Where are you two in, in terms of taking donations or not from real estate and, and this whole trend where somehow it's a badge of honor for a lot of folks to reject one industry's donations? Eric's taking all of them for his future mayoral campaign, I think. is Not, the... not, not, not a candidate for mayor, but if I were a candidate for mayor, I'd, I would gladly accept uh, legal contributions from anyone uh, who wants to make them. That doesn't mean when someone gives you a contribution that they own you or that they speak for you that you necessarily have to agree with them all the time. I've taken money from lots of PACs and groups. I was endorsed and taken money from uh, the UFT, for instance, United Federation of Teachers, but I support charter schools. I went to public and Catholic schools. I support tax credits for families who send their kids to religious schools. So it doesn't, it's not an implicit endorsement of that particular union or special interest group's agenda, I think it's sort of disingenuous for people to say, I'm not taking the real estate money. That's ridiculous. Uh, that, that means you're not gonna take money from landlords, from anybody that owns any uh, property in the city or people that work for uh, Century 21 or, or, uh, or B6 or one of these big uh, real estate companies. I mean, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. The fact is that uh, people making contributions is a form of freedom of, of uh, political participation and freedom of speech and people have a right to contribute, people have a right to refuse, but I think that it's kind of silly to say, we're gonna have this blanket, I'm never taking money from this sector or that sector. Well, then I guess when you're elected, if you win the election, your door won't be open to that community or to that industry. I think it's rather foolish for politicians to, to fall into that trap. But isn't it true that if, um, if someone's knocking on your door and asking for a meeting, you're more likely to grant the meeting to someone who's made a donation than someone who hasn't? I mean, that's, that's that's that's, ne that's never been the case with me. I have not opened the door for lots of people who gave me money. Uh, but uh, the point is that uh, when somebody gives you a contribution, again, the contribution limits are so restrictive in New York that, I mean, can somebody really buy a politician for $175 matchable claim? I mean, really, if somebody's for sale, they're, they're selling themselves pretty cheap for $175 or even at $1,000, depending on which uh, office you're running for, which election is, can you really buy a politician for $1,000? Well, maybe maybe in, in Illinois or some other, you know, New Jersey, but not in New York, for sure. No, but I, look, I'll say, I will say this, uh, I, you know, I think all of us can recognize that in some cases you can get yourself in, like I think that some are clearing their conflicts or appearance of conflicts if they're running for citywide office or something like that. And you can recognize that. The other part of it is I think in Albany, in particular, the amounts of money that you can give, you know, do call both for to question, not not like a single entity. I'm saying, but do certainly call up to question the, the need for some stricter campaign finance laws there. To if you know if the if people are trying to offset the appearance of conflict, I think Albany should do a better job getting themselves. As, as Eric said, I, I I'm not sure Eric's full. So I don't know where he is on the camp the campaign finance question. I think he's supportive of it, but. I, I for sure am. I think you should you should have more limitations on how much you can take from folks. You should strengthen that program. I don't get too into the, the kit. Uh, on real estate donations. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Corey Johnson did say he was not taking real estate donations to avoid a conflict of interest. N nothing against real estate, just wanted to avoid the conflict of interest. But wouldn't you say, you know, Eric, that it is for most candidates a purely political calculation as to how many votes you know I would get by rejecting real estate money versus taking it? I, th I think there's definitely, the politics is always involved in, in a decision like that. And, you know, Corey's not the only one. There are lots of other candidates who are running for citywide office and local offices that, has, that have sworn off taking money from the real estate industry. I just don't think it's a good idea. I think that everyone deserves a seat at the table, even the people that you fundamentally disagree with. I, the one problem I have with the campaign finance laws in New York City, and I've said this to them, and they, this is nothing that, any, that they're ever gonna change, is that we restrict small businesses from making contributions, but we take money from labor. So we allow 
unions, which I've been proudly endorsed by many unions over the year. I grew up in a union household. My grandfather was a union steam fitter. I support prevailing wage laws and, and all that good stuff. But the point is that if I have pizzeria owners or bakery owners or small restaurant uh, owners and operators in my district who want to have a voice in, in what laws are being passed and what decisions are being made and who represents an area where they're spending a lot of money and opening a business, they cannot make a, a, a non-matchable contribution. We've shut out the small business community and we've, we've allowed the, uh, the labor folks to have a seat at the table and to participate in the uh, electoral process, but we basically shut out the small business community. You want to ban contributions from Walmart and Target and the big guys, that's fine. I may not agree with it, but I get it. But the small mom and pop shops, especially in the outer borough, that, that are the economic engines of these communities and the main job creators in these communities, they don't have a say in the local elections unless they write out a personal check. And that's not fair. You know, one of the tricky things, and the council does this all the time, is you try to draw a distinction between small businesses and large. But at some point, you have to draw the line. You have to say, if you have more than 50 employees, you're a large business or more than 100. You know, that means if you're like 49 and the threshold is 50, you know, you hire one more person, suddenly you're in a different category, you lose all kinds of benefits. It seems like a very unnatural sort of impediment to growth. But I want to move on. You, you ran for a public advocate, Councilman Ulrich, and you lost to, you finished second to Jamani Williams. He recently threatened to not sign tax warrants, uh, which basically would have made it impossible for the city to send out property tax bills. And uh, if you can't send out bills, then one third of your budget would have vanished, uh, theoretically. Uh, what, what was your thought on, you know, taking that office and trying to sort of use uh, that as leverage to, to get some, some power that the office doesn't really have? You know, I, I thought that there was an opportunity in that race to elect someone who could be a counterbalance to the mayor and the, um, and, and the so-called progressive politics that's coming out of City Hall. Um, you know, uh, sorry, the uh, phone just went out for a minute. But uh, the point is that uh, I thought that I could be, uh, you know, a, again, a counterbalance to the mayor. I thought there was a real opportunity. There were 17 candidates in that race. I came in second. Uh, Jumani uh, recently uh, brought up this idea of using a, a, a provision of the law that's really never been tested. That, I'm not going to opine on that. I'm not an election law attorney. I, I'm not going to pretend to know all the particulars. I know that some people have questioned the legality and the, and the practicality of that. I will tell you that I am disappointed that the city pretty much bent over backwards uh, to help uh, tenants, and rightfully so, and people who were one paycheck away from you know, having to go into a homeless shelter, but they really didn't make any accommodations for landlords in the city who uh, aren't receiving their rents because people are out of work, understandably, but at the same time, the city still sent them a property tax bill and told them you have to pay it by July 1st, and if you don't, we're going to send you a nasty letter and charge you interest. I just think that we, we, we have to balance the scales here. If we want tax revenue and we want the cooperation of the real estate industry, then we have to engage them in an honest and meaningful way and not strictly use them as an ATM machine, even when they're really tapped out and they don't have it because their tenants just don't have the money to pay the rent. I don't want to see people kicked out on the street. I don't think anybody does. But at the same time, we made little to no accommodations for property owners and landlords okay, who are keeping the city afloat right now and paying for all of those services that we all want to see. What do we do? We sent them a bill and we said, if you're late, you know, we're going to charge you interest anyway. We, we didn't make any real accommodation for them. And I was disappointed to see that. Well, it was 18. I think the problem with the real estate industry had was it was 18% interest. If you have an assessed value of, of more than $250,000 and 18%, I mean, that's a penal, sort of a very, it's a high penalty rate that goes back to the days of the early 90s when interest rates were a lot higher. And uh, loan and sharking, was, loan sharking. And that was a big fight we had at the floor of the city council, I guess, just a couple of weeks ago over the interest rates. And it's a good conversation. It's hard to have it on the, the floor of the city council, but it's certainly a good conversation we've had behind the scenes with, with colleagues to try to figure out what they're appropriate. Well, I'd rather you have it on the floor of the council, right? So we can see what you're saying. Well, I just mean it's hard to actually do it when it's when you're um, unable to really get, get get like a financial note on the on the change or to try to hear um, uh, both sides of the argument. It's, it's not always you know all things are imperfect here, but that's one uh, you know also not the perfect way to we, get, get like if, a financial note. If, if I could add just one more thing, you know, I tried to sign an amicus brief to join on to that lawsuit challenging the whole uh, inequality in the in the property tax system. And, uh, you know, I, I was told that I didn't have standing and that I couldn't join that lawsuit. We know that the assessment system 
uh, punishes people who don't deserve to be punished and rewards people who don't deserve to be uh, rewarded. I mean, the, the, may the mayor pays less property tax on his house in Park Slope than my constituents pay who are newly arriving immigrants from Guyana or Trinidad or uh, Dominican Republic when they buy a house in Ozone Park. And their house is worth a million dollars less. Their house that they buy in Ozone Park or Woodhaven might only sell for uh, 899000 or 799000 The mayor's $2 million beautiful townhouse in Park Slope is paying less in property taxes. Something is wrong with the system. And the mayor kept saying that he wanted to do something about it. Well, we haven't seen anything. And now, of course, I don't anticipate them doing anything about it because they need the money. They're but not going to turn off the commission. We have a commission. That's not enough. Yeah, I'm we joking. have a commission for everything. That's the problem. Too many commissions and not enough decisions. Yeah. I guarantee that if you were poll in the mayor's neighbors in Park Slope, you know, and I've lived in this community for you know more years than I care to admit, basically my whole life, most of those folks think they're paying too much property tax, even though they're paying less as a percentage of their home value than people in your district. Every I, single person yeah. across the board has a gripe with the property tax system. It means it's that I don't think that means it's working. Sometimes it does mean something's working, but I think it's just flawed and I think all it needs. Well, their gripe is never, I'm paying too little though, is it? You'll never know. <laughs> Except for Martha Stark. The unfairness of the world that we live in is uh, no one ever says this is just a, just is just right. <laughs> right. Well, by the way, just to update our viewers on where that lawsuit stands, is the real estate industry did back this um, effort to call the property tax system unconstitutional, and they won at the lower court level, but their suit was dismissed at the appellate division, and they are appealing that. So presumably, this will go to the highest court in the state. And that's just to keep the lawsuit alive. And then they actually, actually go back and win the lawsuit. So it's definitely a big mountain to climb. And, you know, so I don't know, Eric, uh, you didn't seem to be too optimistic that anything would happen on the legislative end of this. But you, you do know something about passing legislation. Um, it's, it's probably pretty difficult for you to do as, you know, one of the three Republicans in a 51 member body. But you know, what's the key to getting something like that through prop property tax reform? I think that uh, people having realistic expectations, uh, people having honest conversations. I think that uh, when you have people who negotiate in good faith, you can get a lot, uh, a lot done. I've been able to do that in the council. I passed a law that created the New York City Department of Veterans Services. I'm very proud of that. I passed a lot of bills uh, that helped people who were struggling to rebuild their homes and businesses uh, from Hurricane Sandy. I passed some uh, very important environmental uh, bills uh, over the years. So I have a, I have a very strong record uh, in the council of passing, I think, really meaningful legislation. But I was only able to do that because I was able to work across the aisle and I had earned the, the trust and the respect of uh, my Democratic colleagues. And uh, again, we don't agree all the time, but we have a, I have great relationships in the council. I think I've made friends for life. Uh, I've been there since 2009, and, uh, and I, I enjoy working there. I think it's a privilege. I think we take it for granted sometimes uh, what a privilege it is to actually sit there and make decisions that can impact the lives of millions of New Yorkers. I, you know, I sometimes just sit in the chamber and say, my God, I, I'm so blessed to be here. I, you know, I, I think that this is something that uh, so many people have tried. Not everybody's been able to actually accomplish or get there, but I, I'm lucky enough to be here, and I'm going to make the best use of my time. And if I have to work with people and compromise, which I think is a dirty word now, that's something I'm willing to do uh, well, to get couple, things done. We have a couple of questions from the audience, which I want to, uh, on the chat board. One, one is uh, for Mr. Power. So Councilman, you had a bill that, that affected real estate agents in New York City. And so this, uh, I, I sense that this question comes from a real estate agent. I believe it does, yes. And so tell us about that bill, what happened and, do you have any regrets now that real estate agents can't put a deal together because of the COVID emergency? Look, I don't like, there's two sides. I mean, I just want to be really clear that there's, there's, there's certainly um, a very complicated picture here. I, I have long felt like it has been unfair for a person who is searching for an apartment where they don't opt in personally to go find a representative and bring that person with them to a transaction to show up and to be asked to pay a fee essentially that I believe the landlord should be paying, which is the way it's done in many other cities. And I put forward a proposal that accomplishes that because I think it's, we're asking tenants often, I've been, I've been part of this process, 
They have to pay a lot of money up front. And the Albany solved some of those issues. They did create some limitations on how much you can pay, security deposit, I think some fees, so which definitely helps. And I think that the Department of State then had at one point done some rulemaking around this, which I think is still being challenged in court, if I'm correct. So we're going to see what happens in court and then, you know, talk about this issue from there. I've talked to lots and lots of brokers, lots who are working very hard. I think lots who are impacted by COVID. And I know that's really severely hurt their income. And I'm totally sensitive to that. And I've always tried to be very earnest in my way we have this conversation. I think that I think this has been long set up to have this the way it is. I don't think it, it I don't think it should be that way untangling it to be the way I want has also proved, sometimes proved to be difficult. But I do think it's, I just, I hear from so many people, I'm 36. So I hear from a lot of people my age and younger about how expensive it is to move and find a new apartment in New York City. I'm trying to help them. I think it's extremely important that they don't have to dip into their savings or go into debt over. You know, the tricky part is, Gordon, we built this system. We only have a couple minutes left, but we've built yeah. a system you know, up to the point where now a lot of brokers are relying on this income. But, you know, I could see the argument where if I'm a tenant, I'm looking for an apartment, I find it on my own, I show up, you know, I, I'm chosen to be the tenant and I have to pay a broker's fee to someone who was just there, even though I found the apartment and I did all the work so I can understand. But of course, that's, that's, that's my thesis, by the way, and I, I actually think landlords should be paying it. The reason I said the tenant should, the tenant should only pay a month is to say the tenant, I'm giving the tenant, I'm giving the broker the opportunity to collect rent from the from the tenant based on work that's been done behind the scenes that I've never seen, posting and doing work on it. But I think ultimately the landlord should be paying for it. Um, and I, 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 you know, it's been a, it was before the recent budget stuff was probably the most contentious uh, here we had the city council, but I, I sat there for all of it. I listened, I took notes and tried to get myself uh, again better on And one last question, this comes from one of our favorite landlord attorneys, Sherwin Belkin who knows the rent law backwards and forwards. And, and I know both of you actually, uh, Councilman Ulrich, you're probably one of the few Republicans I know who supports uh, rent regulation. But he, his question is, if you believe in affordable housing, why oppose income testing for rent regulated housing? So the new law, no matter how rich you are, you can get rent stabilized housing. Well, I'll, I mean, I'll answer that. I mean, I, I, first of all, you'd be throwing some people out of their existing housing if you're doing income testing stuck to today on people's rent regulated housing and you would create massive instability and I don't know where you would draw the lines anyway but you create massive instability and you'd potentially be throwing a bunch of people out. We do in the lottery do income testing now. We do it in terms of I mean it's it's a it's a it's a formula that very few people can really understand. You need the chart in your I used to have to chart my wallet but uh we need the chart. So we, we do but you're talking about affordable housing lotteries for new projects not the one million, almost one million rent regulated uh, units that we have. Correct, yes, I am. And I don't think we should be throwing people out of their apartments today and creating mass instability in the housing market by uh, doing uh, tests on people who have been living in those apartments for years. And Councilman Ulrich, do you have a position on uh, income testing? Yeah, I think income testing moving forward would be a good idea. But again, I, I wouldn't want to displace anyone who's currently in their apartment uh, right now, I have so many uh, senior citizens right now living in rent regulated apartments in Dayton Towers in the Rockaways. And these are people who are on fixed incomes and maybe their incomes have crept up. Maybe they've gotten, you know, some other source of income from uh, uh, some other source. I don't know. I mean, I'd, I'd hate to see them displaced, but I think moving forward for new tenants, I think it's a good idea. We want to make sure that the that those apartments go to the people who need it and deserve it the most. And those are the, you know, the working class and the lower uh, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, people at the lower income bracket, we want to make sure that they get priority uh, when it comes to those apartments and that they can stay in those apartments. Well, we're going to have to end it there. Certainly the housing mismatch in New York City, we could do a whole show on and right sizing housing. So people in, you know, one single people in huge apartments move to smaller units and families are able to utilize those units and same thing for single family homes. But we are out of time for today. So thank you very much to Councilman Keith Powers and Councilman yes. Eric Ulrich. We are back uh, on Wednesday at five o'clock to talk about office leasing. So please, if you're in the office business, come back at five o'clock and tune into our next edition of TRD Talks Live. And don't forget to go to therealdeal.com and subscribe. Thanks again, everyone.